couldn't unmute for a sec there. Um, hey everyone, um, I'm Jess. Thank you for the intro and thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I'm really excited about this week's panel and the panels that we have in the coming weeks. Um, we've, we're so lucky to have some really, really, really incredible athletes joining us. We're very lucky to get to hear from them and learn from them. So huge thanks to them to, for donating their time because everyone's busy and they have some incredible wisdom. We kind of thought of doing this. Um, it started um, amongst my own training group. We were chatting about, you know, we should really create some sort of panel talk or something. And we, my group will be doing this next week. So you'll hear from us too. But the idea kind of started when we saw um, a young girl from Caltaf training by herself at Glenmore. And it was very cold. And she was just out there doing a workout all by herself. Uh, I think her dad was watching her because she was quite young. But it just really reminded us that there are lots of athletes out there just trucking along, just putting in work, waiting for races to come back. And we were like, well, can we do anything to keep them connected and keep them together and make this maybe a little bit more fun um, than just training solo and feeling very alone? So this is our attempt at helping. And I hope that you learned something and gained some insight. And I'm going to stop talking now because we have really, really good guests who should be doing more talking. So I will introduce them. The topic of today's panel is learning from legends. So we've got three incredible Athletics Alberta alumni with us. Um, so they're going to tell, tell us a bit about their sporting careers, what they've done since, and sort of reflect back on what their time was like as an athlete and what they've learned now that they've moved on from sport. So our first is Shay. Shay is a retired two-time summer Olympian. Um, he went to the London um, 2012 Games and the Winter Games um, in Pyeongchang in 2018 as a bobsledder. Shay entered the Canadian sports system at the age of 12 and rose through each tier until his retirement at 31. His career spanned competitions from the club, school, provincial, and national and international levels between 2003 and 2018. So that's a very long career. Shay also volunteers wherever possible in the sport community. As an administrator, he is the past chair of the COC Athletes Commission, a past Athletics Canada athlete rep, and has held ex officio roles with the COC and the Canadian Sport Institute Calgary. He also serves as an Athletics Alberta starting official, so he might be the guy with the gun on the start line. <laughs> Shay has a passion for environmental sustainability along with his love for sport. His current role as the IOC Young Leader merges sport with sustainability at the grassroots level. He serves as a member of Eco Athletes Advocacy Group and the IOC Sustainability and Legacy Commission. Outside of sport, Shay is a professional engineer and works as a Hydro Ottawa project manager leading the LRT expansion program in Ottawa. This involves managing the interdisciplinary scope, technical designs, and budget of the utility connections to new LRT stations for the $5 billion project. Shay was born in Nigeria and was raised and schooled in Senegal, Italy, and the United Kingdom, as well as Canada. He tries to bring elements of his past travels into his daily life. This ranges from cheering on the AS Roma soccer team, enjoying a good quality West African meal, or catching up with the latest British TV. Our next panelist is Neville. Neville was a former national team track and field sprinter turned bobsledder for Canada. He has had the opportunity to represent Canada at three Olympics in 2010, 2014, and 2018, and eight world championships. Through his journey, he has gained experience and knowledge, which has propelled him into his new role as a speaker, performance therapist, and coach. Neville shares his story and experiences and hopes to empower and inspire others to never give up, give up on their dreams and goals and always believe in themselves. And our third panelist today is Megan. Megan finished 15th in the 5,000 meter final of the 2018 Olympic games. And she set a PB to make it to that final, which doesn't always happen at the Olympics. Um, she's a three-time Canadian champion in the 5K. She was the Canadian champion in 2005, 2006, and 2007. And she set a Canadian record in the 3K indoors at the 2008 World Indoor Championships in Valencia, Spain. Her favorite quote okay. is, <laughs> You never really, uh, you're never really playing an opponent. You're playing yourself, your own highest standards. And when you reach your limits, that is real joy. She's a twin. She's from Edmonton. She's the youngest of six kids who are all great athletes. And her only pre-race superstition when she was competing is that she loves to eat salmon the day before a race. And every time she breaks it, she doesn't race well. So good thing salmon is ready, readily available in lots of countries around the world. So these are some incredible athletes and I'm really excited to learn from them tonight. So 
let's just start off right off the bat. How did you get into track? What was your main motivation for getting involved in athletics? Why don't we start with you, Shay? Evening, everyone. Um, you know, when I think about it, I think it was just, it was one of many sports that I was doing. I, the story I tell people is that my homeroom teacher in grade four suggested I join uh, a local track club because I'm from Ottawa and it was the Ottawa Lions Track and Field Club. But before, and that was because it was an Olympic day and I had done well at the school Olympic day and like the 15 lap race, you know, something arbitrary. Uh, so it was just completely by chance because I was also doing volleyball and soccer and basketball and every other sport. But I stayed in track because uh, I was better at it than other sports, but just the sense of sort of achievement I got on, on the track was, was more than any other sport, maybe because it's individual. So my motivation was just uh, to be better, better and better. Good, how about you, Neville? Um, for track, I mean, I started at a, a pretty young age. Well I, I, well, I played tons of sports at, at a young age, just whatever I can get my hand on. And um, um, I remember uh, I did some track and that I actually tried um, cross country one time just to kind of get out of school. <laughs> and um, <laughs> it was the biggest mistake of my life. So I was like, you know what, I'm going to keep it to the shorter distances. So uh, uh, yeah, comp uh, as a kid competed and then I think it wasn't until probably around high school when I realized that like, you know, I had more potential to, to, to get further in track and field. And, you know, growing up, I didn't really know too much about track and field or, or, or had the opportunity to always uh, engage in a lot of other sports because uh, a lot of them were paid and we weren't, didn't have that financial stability. And I was that guy that would always um, during school, we go to the track meets and I'd have my, my hoodie and my jeans on and, and sitting on the stands at, um, and Megan would know this too, uh, at Skona, just sitting at, on the stands waiting. And then when they say Marshall in, you know, everyone checking for the hundred meters and I strip down to some ball shorts and like head to the line and sit down and just kind of wait around. And, you know, everyone's warming up as well too. And um, I'm kind of like, you know, people are like, aren't you going to warm up? I'm like, warm up. I'm like, all these guys are getting tired, man. I'm all about conservation of energy. So I got, you know, and the thing was, I believed it because when I got into, when I raced, I was putting a whooping on all these guys. So, and then, um, yeah, it wasn't until I tell you the truth until I got to university where I met my coach and, you know, he kind of explained to me kind of like the potential I had and if I actually trained and then I just, yeah, I stuck with it. Um, the biggest thing for me, what I, I enjoyed about it was that it was not only an opportunity to challenge myself against other individuals, other athletes, but uh, to challenge myself as well, too. The classic basketball short sprinter beats everyone else. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> How about you, Megan? My first um, introduction to track was pretty similar to a lot of um, people from Edmonton, was the Edmonton Journal Games. Um, it's the big thing that my elementary school participated in was the eight by 200 meters. And not everybody makes this track team in elementary school. So I, and my older brothers were all very good at it. They made it. I didn't make it in fourth grade. In fifth grade, I made it as an alternate. And my dad drove home from Fernie in a snowstorm when we were skiing to help me watch this race. <laughs> and then in sixth, I decided I would get up early every morning, run around the block and go back to bed before my brothers, before my family realized I was out and I decided to discover that if I trained, I got better and I actually made my eight by 200 meter relay that year. Um, but I didn't actually join a track club until later in junior high school. I, and my goal for that was actually cross training for ringette. I played ringette in the winters and I used to swim, but then I had some shoulder problems. So I just kind of jumped into it from just liking to run. Nice, but nice. I wasn't very <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, then you got, got better every year, which feels pretty good. <laughs> Maybe not every year, but <laughs> at least when you were developing. <laughs> um, so moving on the timeline, um, I know that this was a long time ago, but I want to ask you guys a little bit about your transition from being a junior to a senior athlete. And I know that it was a long time ago, which means probably only the most impactful things would now stick in your memory. So what was it like transitioning from probably a young 
instead to a maybe a smaller fish in a bigger pond as a senior athlete. Uh, we'll start with you, Neville. Um, so I guess transitioning to a senior athlete. So once again, like I, I mean, doing track high school, I actually did really well in track and field cities and provincials. Um, and I was, I was actually competing in the, the one, the two, the four by four by one and, and long jump. And then, um, I think after my first, after my, my first year university, um, my coach was like, uh, um, you're going to win nationals, uh, for indoors. And then, um, and lo and behold, that happened. And then I went to my first um, national team, which is World University Games in 2005. And then uh, after that, that kind of opened the door. So I think when I, 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 I didn't, I think that was the only um, kind of, I guess, junior or self-funded team that um, I was on. And then after that, I kind of um, got onto the senior national team. So I, um, the transition, I mean, I didn't really get to experience, I guess, being on a junior team per se, uh, besides uh, World University Games. But um, yeah, after that, that was kind of like my transition into competing on a senior national team. And it was it was it was nice too. a little intimidating at first, too, because, I mean, you know, you you want to make sure you're on that team. So you kind of mm -hmm. listen to every, all, like even with the coaches and you want to mm -hmm. like, you know, take in as much as you can. But yeah, that was my experience. Mm -hmm, cool. What university did you go to? U, U, U of A. Nice, nice. How about you, Megan? So when I was a junior, I was very excited to make a team. And that was always kind of my big goal. So by the time it went, and I um, I was always, I mean, happy, I guess I should say, but um, I my goals were to be very, very well-rounded when I was younger in my early career and to make the team. And I never really fully prepared myself for the performance of when I was at the national team event. Um, I was very fortunate to compete as a junior, I think a junior twice at World Cross Country and the experience of being able to be there with the seniors as one team is awesome. I think that especially in Canada, it's such a great experience to get to rub shoulders with um, the best that was, still very memorable to me, but it wasn't until I actually had a bad injury my second year of college. Um, I hurt my knee um, doing something non-running related and it kind of made me think that I might not be able to run again. And it made me really transition from being, trying to do everything and be a runner among everything to changing the focus of just willing to sacrifice a lot to be a great runner. And um, it was, being able to, I guess, sacrifice um, or make choices to be the best runner that I could be and to set goals, not only just to make the team, but really truly believe in myself that at meets that I can compete and that I'm not just fortunate to have be there, that I'm there to perform. And that was a very different mindset for me as a senior. <laughs> I chuckled a bit when you told that story because Meg and I actually went to the same university and we had the same university coach. We went to West Virginia University and I remember Meg had hurt her knee. She's older than me, but she hurt her knee and then had completely renewed like motivation, chose that she wanted to be a runner and completely elevated her performance, ended up winning NCAAs, amazing career. But while she was rehabbing her knee, she exclusively arm biked on one of those arm biking machines and from then on anytime you had a hangnail a sliver a sore tooth you were on the arm bike machine because it worked so well for Meg <laughs> Meg became a great runner not because of the arm biking machine but because she was now committed to being a runner <laughs> but man I spent a lot of time on that arm biking machine thanks to Meg <laughs> uh, I see Dave's, uh, <laughs> Dave's holding up his West Virginia uh, hoodie there Beautiful. I love it. <laughs> it looks good. <laughs> oh, and guys, <coughs> I'm sorry. <coughs> I forgot to mention, if you have any questions, um, pop them in the chat and we'll deal with them at the end. We're saving time for, for um, questions at the end. So Shay, how about you? How did you transition from a junior to a senior athlete? You know, I bet there's still people arm biking right now all over West Virginia because of, because of Meg. It's going to be probably just... many. <laughs> my, my transition was pretty rough. Um, cause I was just, a, I was taller than most athletes as a junior 
And that just made things a, a little bit too easy for me. And I didn't appreciate what you actually had to do to be a good athlete at the senior level. My last junior team was 05 and it was Pan Am Juniors. I didn't make the junior team in 06, which would have been World Juniors in Beijing. Uh, and then it was just like, a, a, I, I didn't even come close to making teams in 2007, 2008, which were my first years as, as a senior. Um, and then I, it was my, I was in university, I, I changed coaches and my, my second university coach was what, who introduced me to what it actually took to become a, a you know, a good senior athlete. You know, he looked at my nutrition, looked at my technique, you know, I started lifting a bit more, I started getting more flexible. So at that point I realized, you know, okay, I can't just sort of walk into the track like Neville did back at Stona and expect to sort of, you know, not embarrass myself too much. Um, so that, that, that was my transition. It was, it was rough, but it, it worked in the end. And where did you go to university, Shay? I went to university at Loughborough University. It's in the United Kingdom. It's about an hour and a half north of London, right in the middle of the island. Oh, cool. That's a big track hub. Yeah, it is. Loughborough is one of the, the biggest sport universities in the UK. <laughs> All right. So we've talked about some easy transitions. We've talked about some more difficult transitions. Now, you guys, what is your biggest accomplishment? If I were to say, what are you the most proud of in track? Not necessarily your biggest accomplishment, but something that sticks out is, yeah, that was good. What would you say? Uh, we'll start with you, Meg. Um, my most fun, my biggest accomplishment on paper, I think is setting a personal best in the Olympic semifinals and being and making the final. Um, but my most, um, I would say winning the NCAA 5K um, I was hurt kind of going into it and it was such a close finish and it was just such a memorable day for me that everything just kind of happened. And, um, I just, it just makes me smile every time I think about it and proud that I was actually able to pull it off. It was a slow race. It was a tactical race. We went out and the first round got booed. Um, but then it just sort of started clicking and it was just a race of a race there's just no feeling like when it all comes together it's just it's just the best because it's such a rare experience <laughs> uh how about you Shay oh I'm sorry Meg I cut you off <laughs> okay Shay <laughs> uh I I would sort of say it was my entire 2012 season because you know everyone knows you know you've got good seasons you've got bad seasons and then, you know, to me, it seems like everyone's got just that one season, which stands out, you know, and that's, that's the season you got your carding. That's the season you got your PBs. And like, that's, that's at the point where you don't necessarily PB every year. So I, I would say my, my, my greatest accomplishment was the consistency I had that, that season. Cause even when it, even if it was racing Canada or the States or Europe, I was able to run consistently at the same times. And I was able to sort of uh, execute under pressure at sort of like the test events and at the games itself and, and then the, the, the Olympic final you know the result wasn't great but but I was just really happy with how you know with all like the the pressure after the heat when we had you know we were ranked third the third fastest team and half of them half people expected us to medal and the other half says well you guys have you've done you've done all you can do now just be happy to be there but to be able to sort of execute my best race and know that I couldn't have given anything better on top of a season like that that's probably my best accomplishment that's awesome you're right consistency is so underrated and it's so much harder than I think people appreciate and how about you Neville um for me I think one of my proudest moments or greatest moments in track and field would have been in the, the 2007 year when I won my first international medal so um you know, uh, I went to nationals, won a bronze medal there, and um, but I didn't get selected to the uh, Pan Am Games team. And I just remember feeling devastated and like, you know, just go to uh, uh, World University Games because, but the thing was for me was that if you go to World University Games, technically you're not allowed to go to World Championships. Mm -hmm. So then um, I ended up going to World University Games and uh, um, did the 100 meters there. And actually, one one uh, got third place, but then something happened with the there was a false start, 
And then they said, um, I went from third to like fifth to like seventh <laughs> to eighth. And then I was like, I just remember I was so upset and there was confusion. I left the, the stadium and I walked back to the village and, and probably about maybe I've been walking like for like 45 minutes or so. And then they called when the therapist was with me and they called and they said, um, tell Neville to get ready for, uh, uh, the, tomorrow morning he's gonna re, redo the race I just remember <laughs> thinking like man I'm not a distance guy I'm like look how long I was walking for and it wasn't like one of those like nice walks too it was like angry walking so like you know when you're angry like power walking and then uh just I remember going back there and um we get get into the stadium it was kind of like you know what whatever happens because I started I was sore I was, I was just fatigued because it was so hot there and and then I was like what you know what whatever happens happens and I remember just coming out the blocks and um just digging real deep and there's actually a picture of me in the finishing line like seeing me fighting but I fought and I ended up getting a a bronze medal so um and then after that like you know um, that was great for me and then they flew me actually over to world championships where I got to compete in the the relay as well so that was like a a great year for me but that moment just the having my first international medal like kind of opened the doors to opportunity and opened the doors for me saying that like I can actually do this and like you know go really far um in in the sport yeah like it recalibrates what you think is possible (laughs) folks that is a great proof that you don't need perfect prep to put out really 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 good performances (laughs) uh that's a good story (laughs) so we've talked about the highs um now I think we should talk really quickly about the lows because everyone knows that part of being a really good athlete is overcoming bumps on the road because there are always bumps and they're never expected so do you have any stories that come to mind on some sort of piece of adversity that you've had to come through come through in your career because I know there's got to be something uh we'll start with you Shay I I can think of two the first one is injuries we all have injuries and it's one thing getting an acute you know hamstring pulls in a random race and maybe you come back from it four weeks later and it doesn't happen again but the the injury that just never leaves you from season to season to season and you get to the point where you have a pit in your stomach at the start of a new season because you're just mm-hmm. freaking out. That is this, am I going to feel it again halfway through? Mm-hmm. And for me, that always, that kind of weighed on me because I ha- I've had foot problems for my entire um, career. And, you know, I, I know when it's coming because I get that, that odd sensation in between my third and fourth toe. And then it just sort of develops into a, a stress reaction is what they always called it, mm-hmm. even though it was nothing on the MRI. And, the, you know, they, they, I felt like they, they thought it was in my head. Mm-hmm. Um, so from each season, whenever I would get that, uh, that would always kind of bring me down a little bit. But I learned with time how to deal with it through just a lot of sort of foot strengthening and, and work and, and therapy. Um, the second low, obviously, would be the race in London where, you know, one minute you think you're going down in history and then the next minute you're not. But the same sort of process in, in dealing with, with that kind of low, you just sort of debrief, review, look at what can be done, what can't be done, and then try not to make the same mistakes again. Uh, and then you move on. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I can relate to the injury fear. It's, it's ever present and it's, it's stressful. It's, it's a hard thing that athletes have to deal with, but it's, it's just part of the game, I guess. <laughs> How about you, Meg? So I've had a lot of Achilles issues like Jess also does. Um, but the actual, the biggest thing that comes to my mind was in 2010, I was in the hands down the best shape of my life. Like it, the injury was not an issue at this point where it had been an issue almost every other year of my running career. Um, and I was got the privilege of racing at the Prefontaine classic, classic in the 5k. And it was, there was a rabbit going out at an extremely fast pace, but my, one of my big goals was to break 15 minutes in the 5k. And this was the day it was going to happen. Um, it, everything, it was a, everything was set up great. And there was a awesome group of girls and it was just one of those races that you just let slip away. And it's probably one of the biggest regrets I still have, um, as an athlete, because I'm never going to get back to that, that fitness or that, just that one race that I, you almost have, mm-hmm. um, and I just mentally let it slip for a little while. And actually, I ended up hitting a time that would have qualified me for the 2012 Olympics if I hadn't broken my foot 
if anyways whatever I had to hit the standard but um I was so devastated after that race that I didn't run my own very best race that I was the most upset I've ever been after race I was upset I was crying I couldn't I couldn't even think logically about anything and I decided to change my whole season um and switch events from 5k to running a 1500 and I just um it's just still kind of the biggest regret that I just wish that I had the the do-over that Navelle had that I just you know go back to that fitness and be able to start that race again because there was no there was no reason for that day to go wrong whereas a lot of times in the past you know dealing with injuries and there's a lot of other reasons but it was just me and I just let that race go um and I think a lot of us have races like that that haunt Mm -hmm. us even 10 years I'm wondering years ago that was 10 years later um and so being able to mentally get over that and turn myself around and still um that and it was actually one of my top three performances in the 5k but I was so upset that it wasn't the race that I wanted on that day that I, I couldn't even come close to appreciating that it was still an okay race. <laughs> um, being able to turn it around and switch, change race plans, work on the 1500, um, getting through, and then eventually getting back to the 5K and then like, okay, I can do this. I can get through this race. Well, it almost gave me shivers because I think that's another thing that's so underrated by a lot of people is how important the mental game is. You can do all the training, you can be right there. And if, if your brain's not perfect on the day, it can slip away and it is the most gutting feeling in the world. <laughs> it's haunting. <laughs> Neville, how about you? Um, I think one of the, the worst, year, well, it was probably, yeah, the worst year for me was uh, the 2007, eight season. So, um, coming off of a high from 2007 of um, world university games and world championships and just, you know, like feeling like um, things are progressing the way I want it to. And I think uh, that year, because of the, I, you know, I wanted to make the game so bad and I, and I put a lot of uh, pressure on myself and then uh, I got injured, uh, pulled my hamstring and, uh, you know, tried to, you know, push myself to kind of get back healthy and, still trying to train in some aspects and then uh, end up getting really sick and then had found out like, um, cause I was doing races. I couldn't finish races. I was getting weaker, slower, couldn't jump as high. Um, and then saw a specialist and found out I had a uh, adrenal burnout. So it was just accumulation mm-hmm. of physical and mental fatigue and uh, tried to see all these specialists and try to get myself healthy. Then went to Olympic trials in 08 and um you know, uh, af- did make it uh, out of the, the semis. And I just, uh, and it was like by 200. So I remember I was just so devastated because it was the first time I think since 05, since I've, uh, um, I've never made um, a final. And, um, and, uh, and, and because it, it was so close and I remember just feeling so devastated and kind of lost because I remember um, after cross, crossing the line and I walked around like aimlessly for like, about an hour because I couldn't believe it actually happened and I was like like you know what do I do now and um and then kind of and 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 the worst part about it too is after you know the team was selected and I kept racing all of a sudden my body just made a switch and then I started to pick up and and, and do better again but um so that that was it was pretty hard but I you know every time a, a, a a a tough situation happens, you know, I always take it as a, um, a, a learning opportunity. And I think for me, what, what I learned from that moment was to not let my, my goals or dream, dreams become a distraction and not to focus um, by focusing on it, that use my goals and dreams as a motivator and focus on the, the, the process or the, the progress in, in, in achieving um, my goals in, in sport. Awesome. So guys, um, none of you are actively competing in sport right now. So what are you doing with your time? What are you up to? Uh, Meg, we'll start with you. Are you still active? Are you working? Do you have a family? Did you say me? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, so I have young children, seven, five, and three. 
um, me and my husband both coach a kind of the youth track club around here. So still a little bit involved in track and running and um, have a group of ladies that we <laughs> run with early in the morning. And um, I have signed up for a half Ironman for the <laughs> summer. So that's my, uh, my outlet. I love working hard. Um, I love training and I love having goals, but my, my time to work out now is really early in the morning. I'm also a physical therapist. Um, my days are either at work or home and my afternoons are running around to my kids activities, um, when they are allowed and, um, yeah, it's kind of, it's, it's their time to shine and, but I'm still me and I still love to, to work out and have my own goals. So just try to give myself some grace and make a little bit of time for everything. Nice. How about you, Neville? Um, so currently right now, I, um, so yeah, I did retire back in 2019, uh, uh, from, uh, bobsledding. I have a, a two, ch two children, uh, a two-year-old son and a six-year-old daughter, which is quite the handful and helps keep me active as well. And, um, but I mean, I still try to stay active. Um, I feel like, uh, it's hard to kind of, uh, come away from, the training, although I don't train as hard as I used to, I still kind of keep up with that. And then I currently kind of function in my big three, which is um, performance massage therapy. So kind of took my experience as an athlete and then my education um, as a, a therapist and then kind of combined it to create my own, I guess, kind of niche for therapy. Um, and then I do um, a lot of uh, public speaking and then uh, performance coach. So uh, everything from mentoring to, uh, I, I, and teaching athletes how to sprint. So working with anyone from, you know, football, bobsledding, soccer, you name it, pretty much any speed sport. So that's kind of the big three I'm working in right now and doing. Cool. How about you, Shay? Yeah, no kids. I am, uh, it's just me and, uh, and my, uh, my fiance. I, since the pandemic began, I've been here in Ottawa. Um, I told myself when I retired that I would do enough exercise that I could step onto a track any day and run at least 11 seconds at 100. <laughs> I'm not sure that's the case anymore. I've been gaining a lot of weight and losing a lot of strength. I, I started cross-country skiing a bit more consistently. I did a couple times at the Nordic Center, but it's a lot easier here in Ottawa because it's so flat. I don't know if you guys have done skiing at the Nordic Center. It took me an hour to get to the Crawford Hut, but 10 minutes to get back to the, to the parking lot because it's just uphill the entire way. <laughs> but, but here in Ottawa, it's so flat. And I'm just, just gliding like there's nothing. And uh, I've also, I got a, because of the pandemic, I got one of those smart bikes um, that you can uh, log on to Zwift and race against other people, which was fun. For the first two months that kind of died down too so i guess it's not maybe it's not the sports maybe it's just me um so i gotta get back on on zwift but i do whatever i can to try and stay uh stay fit but being at my desk all the time and you know the day job is just sort of draining mm -hmm. i'm hoping that once the pandemic finishes i can sort of just go to the office and then leave the office and just be done yeah. rather than just constant phone calls at all times <laughs> and zoom panels <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. The next question is two parts and it's a bit loaded. So, um, so whoever goes first, I'm sorry, but, um, looking back, what was your very favorite part of being a track athlete? And is there anything you tell your younger self, anything that you wish you'd known or that you, you think is important for someone who's currently in track to think about? Um, Megan's smiling. So we'll start with her. <laughs> okay. Um, there's much I miss about life as a track athlete. I think it's a very fortunate um, lifestyle to be able to live, but li live. But my, my favorite thing that um, that I just can't you can't do anymore um, is those hard workouts and the warm up and cool downs with your teammates. Mm -hmm. There's just nothing to me that feeling of like nailing those killer workouts and then cooling down and especially and maybe being female or I don't know if everybody does this but we would just have these little super confident chats about our workout and just get so excited and just the feeling of like that you can accomplish anything at that moment um I that was my all-time favorite part um but then also being able to spend your entire day training um being able to take a nap in the afternoon and calling that part of training 
Um, and then having all having teammates and people that sort of you believe in this common goal together and you're there, you know, you have people to meet at all times and um, you're kind of you're in this together. Um, there's just no, it's hard to go back to that. Even, I mean, I have girls that I run with now, but we don't have the same, necessarily the same goals. And it's just a very different environment as we all have, we're kind of balancing our other side of our lives with just being fit women. Mm -hmm. um, looking back on things and what I would say for myself, um, there's a lot of things probably depending on different moods and different um, parts of my training. But the biggest thing I think that I would say is not to be afraid to take risks or to be afraid of failure um, in that, that there's nothing, nothing that's too big that you, you know, just to not, to not overthink things and just to allow yourself to all the experiences without being nervous of them and um, to give yourself grace, to give myself grace, um, allowing those not perfect days to just be not perfect and to accept them for what they are, probably part of the bigger picture looking back on it is I can see that now, but just in the moment where things are really overwhelming, just to give yourself grace and things are a tough day, realizing that that's a lot of energy that you put into your tough day and you know other things, not everything's gonna be perfect. That's great advice. How about you, Shay? Meg is spot on about that feeling of confidence heading into a workout that is uh, a pretty awesome thing I, I felt it you know when you have a tough 150 250 300 workout but you just know you're going to get every single run because you're in shape that's that's a good feeling but I would say what I enjoy the most and I always I always got chirped um for this is on teams or just traveling to wherever I love to just chat with people Glenroy used to say, well, here goes Shay. He likes to see people and be seen by people just because hanging out, you know, in the hotel lobby or, or at the track and hey, hey, how's it going? Or, you know, how's your season going? That, that was always, um, to me, just uh, a super, super fun part because you, you don't get to see that many types of people or different people from different parts of the world if you're not traveling all over for track. I, if I got a Google message on my phone saying your month in review, Superstore, the park down the road. And, but then, you know, three years or four years ago when I was competing, it was this city and that track and that, um, that that's, that's the best part for sure. What I would tell myself in the past is um, it's not individual workouts that are going to be the end all and be all of your season. It's a cumulative effect and, you know, trust the process, but, if you have setbacks, it's not the end of the world. It's, you've got to think big picture because I found myself too obsessed with, if I don't do this Saturday workout, I'm done. I'm done. I just pack up my season now, which obviously wasn't the case ever. Totally. I always tell myself after a bad workout that like one workout won't make you, it could break you if you, <laughs> if you get hurt or something, but it won't make you. Yeah. Yeah. How about you, Neville? Um, <clears throat> for me, I think the most, the, the favorite moments or the things I, I think I'll miss the most is, uh, yeah, I, I kind of echo with, uh, what Shay was saying in regards to meeting different people from like around the world. Um, I've always been a very big um, fan of like just different languages and anywhere I would go, I'd always try to learn like, you know, how to say hello, goodbye, thank you. Um, how are you kind of um, like those type of things. And I, I remember going and, um, and I didn't know cause I've never been there, but I, I remember I was in Singapore and I remember walking up, uh, we were in the hotel and I got to the front desk and I was like, um, I have a question. I was like, how do you say hello in, in Singapore? He's like, hello, <laughs> you speak English here. And I was like, <laughs> I didn't know. But so, um, but yeah, I, th I think it's always cool to be able to, engage with different people and, and learn I, I i find that they like it too when you actually try to learn um their languages and, and and learn different things and then in regards to um what i would tell my younger self uh i think i would tell my younger self one is to be confident in yourself and um well be confident in yourself and and, and be easy on yourself 
because uh, I know I was always so hard on myself. And, you know, I mean, as athletes, we're probably like the biggest critic on, on ourselves. And I, I remember like even having, if I had a bad race, I'd be so upset sometimes where I'm like, you know what? I'm not even going to cool down. I was like, you know what? You don't even deserve, deserve proper nutrients. I'm going to eat this burger and these fries and just, you know, and I was like, I just always just hard on myself. And um, so that's one thing I, I would always say. And then also, you know, echo that, that um, don't, anytime you experience failure, don't look at it as that you just failed. Look at it as that it's a, another opportunity to learn and develop and grow from that. Totally. Um, I want to save some time for questions, but I have a few more that I really want to get out to you guys. Um, first being, do you have any advice for people who are thinking about retiring soon? What's, what's life like on the other side? Is there anything that you should maybe know if you're thinking about it, but you're Maybe a little scared because all we know is sport. Uh, we'll start with you, Shay. I would say if you're able and you're still competing, uh, try and make the, the retirement uh, process a bit of a phase versus just one day you're an athlete and the next day you're not an athlete because that kind of abrupt change is, is difficult for anybody. For me, I was lucky because I, when I was competing, you know, my parents essentially force me always to be thinking about, you know, what are you going to do after track and make sure your resume is up to date and make sure in your off season, you do this job here because it's only going to be two months or do this part-time job on, on, on Saturday, because what else are you doing? You're just playing video games. Don't try and make it as, as if it's going to harm your, your track and being able to have all these experiences. And eventually my transition to retirement, just, it sort of, it went from being, 90% sport, 10% track, uh, then, you know, 70, 30, 50, 50, and, and eventually it became 100% um, my day job. It made it less painful and, and, and more um, or just, just stressless. And that's mm -hmm. what I would recommend. Make it gradual. It's mm -hmm. not going to negatively affect your, your, your career if you think and start preparing for what will happen afterwards, because mm -hmm. a lot of people do it and still succeed. That's great advice. <laughs> How about you, Neville? Yeah. Um, yeah. Having that. So I, I find that um, I've talked to other athletes too that are still competing and kind of ask them, you know, what are you going to do when you're they're done? And like, they haven't thought that far. And I'm like, trust me, you need to be prepared for when you transition out. So whatever, you, whenever you can, you know, take continue education or, or um, even just using your, your environment as a, a learning opportunity to, to develop and grow as an individual. Like I know, for myself, I knew I wanted to do coaching. I knew I wanted to be a therapist. So while I was competing, I was learning as well. So like I would do a sprint, then I would stand beside my coach and watch everyone else sprinting and then listen to the feedback he would give. And he would ask me questions. Um, or when I was getting therapy, you know, I'd get on the table and I was like, you know what, don't ever, don't dumb it down to me. Just speak in proper terms. If I don't know, I'll look it up or I'll ask questions. And then after I was off the table and, you know, asking questions and being present while I'm on the table, I'd come off and I'd ask to, to be around, to stick around and watch other athletes being treated and then ask some questions as, as uh, there as well. So um, um, kind of like along, along the lines of what Shay was saying, where, you know, a lot of athletes feel that when they are planning for their, their uh, transition from sport or having their, backup plan that that means they're not going to succeed and I was like it's not a matter of not succeeding it's that you need to be prepared because anything can happen so it's better that you're prepared and you know and um have that backup so once you transition out you're good versus then yeah being stuck in limbo and and having no clue what you're going to do because I think that's where the the real struggle comes for a lot of athletes mm -hmm. totally um, Meg, how about you? Well, if I never intended, even while I was in college, to be a professional runner, that, um, so I was very fortunate. I have a, a master's degree in physical therapy, and I worked as a physical therapist even in my Olympic years, um, just not many hours. Um, so I had always was fortunate that I had that in my back pocket. Um, and also, what Shane said, to make it gradual. When I I struggled with injuries and, and so there was this kind of like more and more time off. Um, and then I got pregnant with my oldest child, um, which was, I had planned to get pregnant then, but I had kind of toyed around with coming back professionally. 
as an athlete after and still had the same injuries and just felt like for my mental and physical health that I wanted to, to step down and focus on, on my family and, um, and, and be able to do my job more. So I think it was just nice having different options and different focus. I've always stayed true to myself in having an athletic lifestyle and I've always had lots of interests. So it was kind of a good time to spend a little more time hiking, a little bit more time doing things that mm-hmm. I didn't do as an athlete that I was like, you know, I can look forward to doing these things that I've been wanting to do and that I had used to do before I became um, all consumed by running at the time. So it was almost like some things to look forward to. It doesn't say I miss the running. I don't appreciate all the but there's certain some things that are are nice that my life isn't as a professional athlete anymore. That makes sense. It sounds like, like everyone's just driving home, do it, do it gradually and have outside interests. It's a lot harder if you're really, really singular focused. Um, okay. We're going to switch over to audience questions and I think James, James will be managing that. So I think you guys can just jump in where you'd like, cause some of you will have like opinions on certain questions and others maybe won't. So it's a free for all amongst our panelists. So let's see what we get. I'll, uh, I'll start with the questions in the chat. So Robin typed the first question. Parents and coaches are always striving to support their children and athletes as best they can. Um, would you have any words of advice for them? So open, open to anyone on the panel. Um, oh, you can go ahead, Megan. <laughs> Oh, um, I was just doing the etiquette. I was going to say, as a parent, it's very interesting being both, having been both an athlete, a coach, and a parent, um, that as a coach, especially of the younger kids, um, I try to really let, let the kids ask the questions um, because the motivation has to come from within the child themselves and the Olympic motto, the fire within us is kind of the most awesome motto to in me. Um, so letting, letting the kids really take charge and be accountable and motivated themselves um, is something that is really important. And I think I was very fortunate that I don't think my mom still understands um, what my track times are or anything about track at this point. Um, so to really just kind of let the kids be self-motivated and, um, be there, get them to practice, get them what they need. Um, but as a a parent's job is to support them and love them, but the kid's job is to show up and be hard on, you know, the kids are going to be hard on themselves that they don't need that extra from the parents. I don't know if that makes sense, but it has to come from the kid or the athlete. Thanks, Megan. Uh, any of the other panelists want to add to that? Um, I would say that I, 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 the one thing I do with my little ones is where I let them know that it's okay to make mistakes. Um, and also that, like, for example, my daughter is super competitive and she wants to win all the time. <laughs> and she gets devastated if she doesn't win. And like, even when like she'll try and race me and, and I'm like, you got to earn this W. I'm not <laughs> giving you this W. But um. Yeah, I, I just let like let them know that it's okay to make mistakes, and then I really, I, I I'm pretty adamant of where one I try to be hands off and just let them play, but um I always I instill in her where um if she's trying something and it's hard and I'm like so and, and I ask these questions to her all the time like if it's too hard, what what do you do? She goes never give up, and it's like and what do you keep doing? And she goes keep on trying. So I let her know that and um. And she'll, to the point where when she's trying something is difficult, she'll repeat it back to me. So, you know, um, I, 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 I do my best, yeah, to be kind of hands off and not kind of like shelter them from mistakes or, or, or whatever. I just kind of want them to kind of develop their own path. And, you know, my responsibility will be, well, when she's training, I can help, help with that and guide them with that. But um, yeah, my responsibility will just be kind of to encourage her, guide her. And then if she has questions or, and, or him when he gets older uh, to be there to answer the questions. Thanks Neville. Um, I'm gonna kind of move through some of the questions just cause we're getting close to seven and we can go a little bit over time, but uh, I wanted to give some of the others that asked a question a chance to have their questions answered. So uh, Dave, Dave made a, 
uh, comment question in the chat just about, I think, as it related to the transition of athletes uh, that you guys were talking about and, and uh, transitioning into a master's competitor. And, and Dave, maybe that's in light of the fact that we're holding the world master's, shameless plug, uh, in 2023, so you all can come out and compete. <laughs> That was, was that supposed to actually be uh, this year, right? Yeah. Yeah. We had okay. to bump it because I, of COVID. And uh, disclaimer, I was actually going to train to try and do uh, world masters um, compete. But then after then I was like, ah, it's not going to, I don't think it's going to happen this year, but um, I don't know. Maybe we'll see. We'll see how the body feels. You got two then. years now, Neville. You got two <laughs> years to prepare. <laughs> we'll see. Yeah. Maybe, maybe I might make, uh, yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> make a retirement get some tips from uh, megan to keep my body in shape get on the arm bike <laughs> uh there was a question from the sign up um I, I wanted to get to is what what did you do in high school to help you get signed by a university and some advice for some of the younger athletes out there so track we're very fortunate in that it's a timed or measured sport um and so Basically, um, just especially your grade 11 year is a really well-noticed year. Um, run fast. And we did our, with Leduc Track, um, we had an awesome um, manager. And then with Edmonton Harriers, those were the two clubs I was with transition. Um, we went to the New Balance Indoor National Scholastic Meet, which a lot of, was very visible for a lot of um colleges and then once your name especially in the new balance indoor meets um once your name's up there and you do fairly well you get people will contact you but um and i wrote i wrote some letters to universities as well and i think there's a lot more out there to help more pathways to help kids and i hadn't a clue what i was doing um but was fortunate that i felt like the people that i spoke to um were very helpful Thanks, Megan. Any, uh, anyone else? Simplot in the U.S. Mm -hmm. We took the big bus down to Simplot. Nice. Um, I know I, I want to, uh, I actually want to reference back to some of the transition stuff and, and as it relates to Shay and Shay and I have been connecting on um, over email and, and this has been going on a year now with all of the COVID stuff, but uh, Shay, I just wanted to give you a chance maybe to share with people some uh, information about your Olympic sustainability project and uh, how that would affect track and field moving forward in, in the future. Thanks. Yeah, for sure, James. Uh, I got given some money from the IOC and the COC to sort of uh, try out a sustainability project at Foothills in Calgary. Um, it came out because when I was on, when I was the chair of the COC, I got to go to Olympia uh, for a couple of weeks and a lot of stuff happened there and essentially the idea and opportunity came out of my Olympia trip. But what it means for, for Calgary is um, in my sort of initial research, I realized that foothills, there was no fountain available. You know, you have to sort of buy water from the water truck guy. Even if you bring your own water bottle, you can't fit it into the, the tap in the bathroom. So you're just out of luck, <laughs> you know, too bad, so sad. Um, and then also, at the games, I was able to see what the IOC was doing for sustainability because it's, it's pretty big right now all over the world and they're trying to measure, you know, how many tons of carbon dioxide they're emitting, how many kilos of plastic is attributed to every athlete. But at, you know, Caltaf and New Balance and, you know, um, all, 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 the, all the meets at, at, at the trap, I just felt that we, we could do more. So with the money they gave me, I created this pro this project called Racing to Zero, and we're going to try and kick it off this year for this season, if there is a season. I still don't know yet. I'm hoping, fingers crossed. But it's sort of three things. One, I got a fountain installed at foot at um, at the track, permanent one, and I got a, a mobile one just delivered yesterday. You just sort of plug it in into the hose, and it's got a, a filter inside of it, and you can just sort of wheel it to wherever you want. So two fountains, I'll get it shipped off to somebody in Calgary eventually. And then with the money, that extra money I have, I'm going to try and set the meet directors against each other. I've given them a checklist and they're going to be measured on how sustainable their meat is based on if they have plastic or if they're using paper or if they're doing a bunch of other stuff. And if they're able to sort of measure how people are getting there, bike, walking, car, bus, they're going to have to sort of 
know who's coming and how they get there. I've got some ideas on how to do that. Long story short, with all of that, the winner of this year gets a big wad of cash from the IOC if they're willing to sort of do it. You know, maybe get a new pole vault man if you want. <laughs> you know, it's up to them. And then the third thing is um, there's going to be a passport for people who go to the track who are just the fans and spectators on your phone. You can sort of answer questions based on different sections about where does the Calgary water come from or where where do you sort of can you recycle this or not recycle that just to sort of help educate people on what they can do and then the winner of that gets an interview on the coc website i'm hoping it'll be school kids who do it and they also get some free stuff too of a coc brand water bottle so long story short it's just a way that we can try and do something at the grassroots level to sort of emulate what's happening at the ioc level but we're still fingers crossed that i can i can do it this year Awesome, thanks, Shay. And I, I, as we come to a close, I think uh, this first athlete, athlete session has been amazing. Um, just to hear the broad spectrum of topics and feedback, and um, I really love the athlete transition piece. That's a part of me that um, I'm passionate about. I, I worked in sports a long time in my life, and on the professional side, it's not just unique to amateur athletes. Professional athletes struggle with this transition piece as well, and and um, you guys are a great example of what that transition can look like as you finish your careers and move into your future. So thanks so much for being a part of this call. Uh, Jessica, I want to thank you and Amanda for bringing this opportunity to Athletics Alberta. And uh, again, a special thank you to Shay, Megan, and Neville for, uh, for taking your time out of your schedules to join us. This was outstanding. Um, so we look forward to the next session uh, in the coming weeks, Jess. And uh, um, following this, we've got Jessica's coach, uh, doing one of the coach sessions in about uh, 29 minutes. So if you're tuning in for that one, get yourself a quick break, a, a drink, and we'll see you back here in 30 minutes. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so Thank much, you. everyone. Thank you. Yeah. Take care, everyone.